Welcome to the Big Sky Ideas Fest. My name is Inyan Williams. I am the Vice President of Events for Outlaw Partners here in Big Sky. So far, we have had some amazing talks already with Josh McCain and Jeremy Keller of Big Sky Bravery, which can be viewed on the Outlaw Partners Facebook stream. Last night, we had an amazing conversation on climate with Kathy Whitlock, Max Lowe, Twyla Moon, Kristen Gardner, and Todd Whitlock. Tonight, on stage here, we are joined by Seth Dahl, a video documentary producer for Big Cedar Media for the past seven years and soon a Big Sky Bozeman resident to be working as video director for Outlaw Partners. Lane Lamoureux, a former Marine smoker, Marine smoke jumper and teacher and educator producing training videos for firefighters. Rob Balukas, the chief creative catalyst at Babalukas Creative, which his part-time job to pay for his full-time hobby is a paratriathlete, soon to be participating in an Ironman World Championship qualifier and hoping for his next race coming up in June. Tonight, we are going to watch two clips of a film that Seth is working on producing called Flowing Air. Seth, can you give us a little information about this film? Yeah, so uh, Flowing Air is a feature film um, about Lane Lamro here. Uh, it follows him over the last five years uh, after a paragliding accident sent him searching for a new life. Um, and this clip that we're about ready to watch here is, it, uh, is where Lane reveals uh, that he's got a potential leg amputation coming. And uh, we also introduce um, one of the Lane's good friends who's a part of the film, the secondary character, uh, Justin Bohr. Thank you. I never would have thought that six years after my accident, that I would have more flights post-accident than I did pre-accident. And I'm six flights shy of surpassing that number. I get a little self-conscious and um, reflect in this way that says, well, what do you have to show? And really, I've just been trying to survive the last six years. The second life is, is a life that is unconventional to begin with, so I don't feel like I need to conform. Last year was the first year things were better than the year before. This year, a lot of it's going to depend on what happens with my right leg. I think there's been a, a solid case that's been built for considering an amputation. I think I'd be better off with a prosthetic device. The next step is going to an orthopedic surgeon. They'll ultimately determine what's gonna happen.
So this morning's appointment, maybe the look on my face will say it. More uncertainty. Uh, just don't know yet. So what I do know is I have a follow-up appointment on March 6. A BKA, as they're calling it, a below the knee amputation. The big thing with the BKA is whether or not he can make a socket for me. So that's essentially turning my severed limb into a nice stub. I see the doctor in about a month, and between now and then, he's going to talk to some of my other physicians that have seen me and get their take. And if he thinks he can confidently create a, a functional socket, I think we're going to do it. I want to get this done so I can move on, so I can make a new plan with my life. And I don't want to do it right in the middle of summer because that's the flying season. That's when the flight park needs me. I need the flight park. Because this, it's definitely pulsing through here. I don't know if you'd be able to get up. Today, I had to err on the side of playing it conservative when I wanted to fly. We call this the leading edge, and these little pieces of uh, rigid plastic in this case, they help keep the cells open so that air can get in. I do find myself just baffled, just looking up at this wing sometimes and thinking that I'm doing this. To think that this lightweight, thin material gets me into that flowing air and I'm just moving with the birds. It's changed my life. Amazing, Seth. Amazing that you have gone through what you've gone through and that you are still out there jumping off the sides of hills in high winds with nothing but a parachute. Uh, give us a little uh, talk to us tonight um, about when COVID hit. Uh, it sounds like you were scheduled for some surgeries and had some things that, that were about to go on and then COVID hit and threw a monkey wrench in that. Give us a little insight to what you went through uh, almost one year ago 
right now when COVID came through? Yeah, it was absolutely crazy, the timing. Just having my amputation about a year ago, and I got into my first socket, my first prosthetic limb on, on February 12th, and I was stoked about how the year was going. I had signed up for multiple paragliding competitions, and my stoke factor was high. And it's still high, you know, I, I know everything's temporary, but plans, plans got derailed. And following my amputation, we discovered uh, a problem, uh, or at least we discovered the source of the problem, and that is um, I have so much titanium in me, it's hard to keep track of. And I didn't realize I had a screw that was in the far end of my, of my femur, so it's coming out of the inside of my knee, and it was providing a, a lot of pain. And, and we were gonna address this by having surgery in April. And I was thrilled to have surgery in just a few weeks, and then I could get back to a, a normal-ish life. But, you know, mid-March and everything changed. And the surgery, it wasn't life-threatening, so it got canceled indefinitely. There was no, there, so it was really hard to make plans when there's just so much uncertainty. Very, very, very true. Uh, and, and Rob, uh, you made a, some interesting comment to me that you, when, when COVID hit, uh, you felt like you had already prepared for this in some ways, both mentally uh, to, to get through uh, the COVID times. Uh, tell us about how, tell us about that. Yeah, when people ask, um, I really feel like there's a pattern to it that when you go through something like we've gone through, um, you learn through the rehab process that you're gonna do something that's uncomfortable and not fun, and it's gonna seem like the, you know, impossible the first few times, but you have a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, someone going, keep going, keep going, and you finally get used to it. Like for instance, first time getting out of bed into a wheelchair, I needed a device called a slide board and you just a board, you put from here to the bed, and I get my legs on the ground, and I slide my butt into the wheelchair, and I pull that off. They pull, you'll pull it out from under me, and I carried that around for a long time until I was strong enough to use my arms freely to just um, transition myself from, say, bed to wheelchair, um, and I don't even think about it anymore. You know, it's like this new way is the way. Um, and then there's other things, getting into the car. Now I gotta use a slide board again. Banging my ankles on the side of the car, like all these little things are like, oh man, this is my life, this is gonna suck. But then uh, as time goes on, it's like flipping in the car, I'm out, I'm driving to San Diego or something. Certainly, certainly. Uh, Seth, you were, you were, when COVID uh, a year ago, you were right about to, uh, you know, finish this film up and launch it and be looking forward to film festivals in the summer and that sort of thing. Tell us how, uh, when COVID hit it, how it derailed you this, this past summer. Yeah, so uh, it's been, you know, an interesting journey to say the least. Uh, Lynn and I, I met him um, in a coffee shop six years ago. And I think we came out of that that meeting, just random meeting, deciding to make the film. Um, so I think that week I followed you around with the camera and for six years now it's been in the works. Um, and I've just been following Lane throughout his process after this paragliding accident sent him looking for this, uh, you know, to make sense of his new life. And um, it, as we just kept going down that road with filming and getting together and, and shooting paragliding and, um, some of his, his struggles and the adversities he'd faced, um, you know, it turned into the amputation down the line and then we had to cover that process. And so I got most of it shot before COVID hit US, but we did shoot the latter end of it while he was, you know, still dealing with this screw and having his um, surgery being postponed. But, you know, from the editing standpoint, on my perspective, 
you know, the filming itself didn't, wasn't really interfered with through, by COVID, but, and honestly, it's a perfect time to edit a film, right? <laughs> I was able to just, you know, sit in my, uh, my edit bay and just in my, my house and, 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 you know, go to town over the last four months on the, all the footage over the, all these years of footage. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, so it was, it was easy uh, to deal with the COVID, you know, um, uh, you know, adversity, if you will, in the filmmaking process as I'm just sit sitting there editing this film. But what was derailed was funding, searching for that. I mean, looking, you know, looking for sponsors. Uh, I think I pitched this to some sponsors the week COVID hit you know, the US. So really horrible timing. Um, and it sort of, it sent it, you know, my uh, flowing air in this, you know, quest to get this into, you know, find funding and get this thing, you know, powerhouse this edit, get this thing done, sort of sent that into another world where I had to make a decision, right? And it's, this story needs to be edited. So I really just had to sort of suck it up and just sit there and edit, live off of savings for a while. I'm, sur I'm currently looking for contributing producers and sponsors for that now. And I know everything's going to work out. Just the story needs to be edited. It needs to just, you just need to move forward and figure the rest of that out later. This is, I believe Lane has a powerful story. It needs to get, you know, out there. Um, and that's, you know, you know been the, the process of, of just learning to roll with it and uh, just stay the course, right? Right, right, for sure. Um, Lane, you, you mentioned that uh, later on in the summer you, you got rescheduled for your surgery and that um, it, it sounded like there was some more complications, but then, you know, some successes. So, so tell us about some of those more complications that you had and then some of the successes that you had as well. All right, well, we have a a tad bit of a roller coaster. We got a couple um, humps and a couple dips uh, through this journey. So a few things went really, really well. One of the things that went well was the surgery itself. You know, I, the screw came out. Uh, there was no problem removing the screw. And I was almost instantaneously relieved of the pain. And everything was looking great. But, dot, 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 we're in the COVID world, and that meant follow-up care was really altered. And, and the VA is, and providers across the country are all trying to do as much remotely as possible. So my follow-up appointment with my surgeon is, is via, um, you know, the app on my phone using the little camera. And I just, I think it's safe to say that making a quality informed assessment via video is is not is not the same as face to face so i started walking prematurely and and the incision where they removed the screw opened up and it just started draining fluid i thought i could patch it up myself i went to walgreens and just uh, you know i just thought i could salvage this and a few days went by and then the pain hit and then my neuropathic pain which I get in my now non-existent right foot it, it's like my bellwether it tells me when there's something wrong with my body whether it be in my upper extremities or elsewhere my my um, phantom limb just goes berserk with pain and when that thing went berserk that told me you got to stop what you're doing and address this immediately and I was on a job in the, um, in the Bay Area at the time and just got someone to take me to the Palo Alto VA emergency room, got looked over and it was, wow, this is serious. And this is serious because not only is the infection established, but it's so close to other titanium in your leg. And if the infection gets next to it, it's going to instantaneously just spread. So... I, when I got back to Boise, it was really ominous. It was looking at where are we going to cut? Are we going to re-amputate above his knee? Or are we just going to go for him at the hip? Because I have a rod that goes through the length of my femur. And they wanted to stay ahead of this because infections are potentially life-threatening. And I had surgery scheduled. I wasn't sure if if I was 
going to just lose my leg from this point down or from the hip down. I just knew I had to be there early, first thing Monday morning, and I showed up for surgery. I had fasted, and I was, you know, I didn't really have a choice in the matter. This needed to be done. And I was really extremely fortunate that the antibiotics at that point seemed to be taking hold and had at least prevented the infection from getting any worse. And that's when we decided, hey, you know what? We could buy some time. Let's postpone it. So we postponed it a few days and then a week. And then what are we talking about surgery for? You're good. You're good to go. So that's the highlight of 2020 for me is the fact that I still have my awesome knee and I'm extremely grateful that everything worked out in the end. Well, the, the, the power of, of medicine and the power of science. So it's uh, great to hear that you, you turned back to the doctors and didn't try to fix it on your own, <laughs> so to speak. Um, uh, Rob, uh, you know, through the, through the COVID time, you, you, you mentioned earlier that you've, you've, you've been adapted to living in a limited way and going through the processes that you need to do during, during this time. Uh, tell us about in, that you're also now planning uh, some for, for some upcoming triathlons uh, in the Ironman, for that matter, which is an ultra <laughs> uh, marathon, which you can maybe tell us a little bit about. And, and, and talk to us about your, your training during, during these times and, and how maybe that helped you, uh, you know, get through uh, the, the, the times when things were, were quiet. Yeah, the, there's so many allegories for Ironman. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's why it's the thing that it is, um, one of those being the long game. It's a long race. For some people, it can be 10, well, 10 on average, 10, 10, 11, 12 hours. And so you're planning to figure out, how do I survive a long race that's like 2.4 miles, this is the long one, 2.4 miles of swimming and 112 miles of bike, and then a marathon, a 26.2 mile run. And so, um, it's kind of the, you know, it's the, it's the, the same thing for me in terms of just, uh, you know, figuring out how to, you know, get through, get through the long game. Certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Um, Seth, uh, so how, part of, part of the way that we are all on stage tonight is uh, Seth and I, uh, we're, we're floating down the middle fork of the Salmon River this summer. Uh, we, we both are fortunate enough to work for a company called Boundary Expeditions, and uh, we, we were paired up on a, on a boat, and we uh, were reflecting on, you know, how, how fortunate we were to be in the middle of the Frank Church wilderness, and you started telling me, you know, this, this project that, that you had been working on for, uh, for quite a few years, and it... it, it you know, I was like, well, that, that's a story, and the person that you are doing this on has, has a story as well, so let's, let's work to get it out. Um, how, how, how do you feel um, your, your time in editing, um, you, you were able to, to bring, bring back to life, you know, all of this work that you've done over the years, and, and to, uh, um, you know, here hopefully this summer, we're all going to be able to to view this full-length uh, documentary film. Um, how, how did how did that time, you know, away from it bring bring it back to to what it's going to be today? Yeah, I think uh, you know, I think time in some of these projects makes things sweeter, personally. And you know, you're just sitting there waiting for your time to get back into these edits. You know, get get something told. You and for me, I've just been sitting on a. Um, waiting for that time, right, to get in and start telling, you know, these stories. And I think, well, I was sitting there over the winter, you know, I, I've just finished my rough cut right before coming here, my first rough cut. And going back through all of those scenes that we shot was pretty fun. I have to say it was a, it was a trip down memory lane, you know. Um, we, just to see, uh, you know, what I at the time thought those scenes were going to be about and had shot them that way. 
and then to you know sit there and post you know years later and to relive these experiences and uh, I think one thing for instance stood out really you know st staggeredly stood out that I didn't catch while I was shooting it I mean while you're shooting you can be in the motion of it and just really capturing the content and one scene that stood out is you know Lane when you were really uh, I mean, this is your life, but it, you know, we put this up on, a, on the film, on the screen, it becomes a story, right? And you have, we all have these stories, but Lane's life when he was going to, you know, take the pack test, for instance, what a powerful day that was for your life. And for the film, I was, I was sitting there just trying to get the footage that I needed in this event where he has to pass this, this test. And in the film, as I was editing it, I was like, it occurred to me how profound this, this was for, for his life, not necessarily the film, but this was a major decision. You know, if he, you know, to pass this means he can move on in life in this same world. To not pass means he has to find another life. And I think I love that about filmmaking is that you dive in with this, you know, and especially documentary, I dive in wanting to tell parts of, wanting to tell these stories with, Real, no, clear, no real clear idea of where you're going with it quite yet, and that comes out in post-production. So the, the wonder of storytelling in filmmaking really comes out as you're working these scenes and trying to pull out the content of that. And I'm still working through that, um, but I'm very uh, inspired by Lane's story as a filmmaker, as my, he's my friend. Um, it's really nice to see these, this come together, if that answers your question. It's really, as a filmmaker, as a friend, it's really wonderful to see the vision that I set out to cat, you know, shoot uh, start finding itself as you just jump off that cliff, so to speak, and just start shooting, right? It, the pieces just sort of fall together. Certainly. Um, Lane, uh, you've... You, you mentioned in your in your talk that's going to come up on on Saturday night, and and you've also um, talked about your your recent trip that you took to Colombia, and that you know out of of this uh, um, experience, you you know you you are also an educator and a teacher, and uh, and also a, a, a filmmaker yourself. Uh, and, you say talk about how you like walking around with a camera everywhere, and and so tell us a little bit about um, how you've been able to create um, training videos and working with the NGOs and that sort of thing that's really um, opened up a new world for you that maybe you wouldn't have found had this experience not happened. I'm still blown away that things have come together like they have. Myself as a videographer and photographer for that matter, I'm 100% self-taught. It's purely passion. But the deliverables, they, they hit the target and they impress and they're enough for me to get continued work. And I just love that I'm able to fulfill a need and produce something of value that that I enjoy doing and I feel like uh, I've had great success at it. I feel like my videos, you know, I try to think of myself as a firefighter in the classroom. What would I want to watch? And, and I feel like being able to identify with my audience at the level that I do, because I fought wildfire. Um, I was a wildland firefighter altogether for, for nine years. So that was really, it, it flows through my blood and having the opportunity to keep one, well, quite literally now, one foot in that world is just, I, I just couldn't have imagined things working out as well as they have. And I love that I'm able to produce videos that my, my firefighter friends, like it or not, they're required to watch them. So I get this captive audience of thousands of firefighters who go through fire refresher training every spring and it's just awesome to to still stay in touch with my firefighter family and still be relevant and and fulfill this need and apart from that well and because of that uh, through a, through a connection with one of my smoke jumper buddies 
who no longer smoke jumps, but now uh, works for an international um, NGO, uh, Disaster Humanitarian Assistance Organization, after COVID hit, he called me up and said, hey, Lane, you still making videos? Because we're trying to do our training remotely as much as possible. And I've seen what you produce and we need, we need videos like that. Do you want work? Can you take work? And, and wow, you speak my language. So I had the opportunity uh, through this COVID has, ordeal has actually been one of the greatest developments in, in my vocation as a professional informative and educational video producer i've this has been my year or excuse me 2020 was my year i've it's great to be busy enough where you tell potential clients no sorry i can't i'm i've got too much going on and honestly that wouldn't have happened without covid so it's kind of crazy and a little perplexing to have that juxtaposition where covid was devastating on so many levels but just being prepared and poised to seize opportunities when something came my way i was i was ready for it well that's that's amazing that's a that's a great story for everything that you've been through and still going through to to have it come out in that that realm um rob uh you you um mentioned and i was able to see peek at your your talk today and in about, you know, I, I want to, you to reflect on your support groups um, that, that have supported you through, through your, the years. Um, you know, you, you mentioned how you had a big support group when you had your, your accident that really helped you through. And, and, and I have to imagine that um, being a paratriathlete, you've got a lot of support groups that really support, and, you know, to be going to Italy and you know, around the uh, world to do these, these events. Um, tell how those, those support groups have, have helped carried you through the times and, and gotten you to be where you are today, to be, you know, heading off to another Ironman qualifier. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, I first want to finish the answer to your last question to me, mm -hmm. because I realized I forgot the actual answer. <laughs> and that is that the reason I was telling about the long, long game of Iron Man is that there's an equation that we use that physical endurance is the it's, it's time and consistency equals physical endurance. So um, I actually qualified for the Iron Man World Championships in 2019. And strategically, my coaches and I decided not to go because I wasn't ready for the swim and being the first event I didn't want to go into a 112 mile bike ride and, you know, in the lava fields of Kona, Hawaii, um, beat up. And so, uh, same thing, like serendipity is a funny thing. Like on the one hand, I can't go qualify again in 2020 because they've canceled everything. However, I now have an entire year to work on my physical endurance to be ready in the next year or whenever that, you know, qualifier is going to be or Kona is going to be to um, be better and be in the physical condition and have the physical endurance that I want to have a good race and a solid, um, you know, show up uh, like I want to. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Um, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't even begin to describe what my support has meant to me. It meant to me. Um, they. I mean, they just, they, they, I, I say they bum rushed me. I was part of a triathlon club and in, in, uh, in that year, um, I joined a triathlon club in San Francisco, the Golden Gate Triathlon Club. I joined the training program, um, you know, and then, and we were, had been trained together for a good half of a year. And um, so you get to know each other, you know, and watch, and you're, you're, you're run, playing an endorphin game together. So we're all happy and having fun and working out hard. And our, I say our, our idea of a good time is a uh, 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 seven o'clock Friday night master's swim leading into a 4 a.m. drive an hour north of San Francisco to, to go ride for three or four or five hours um, to train. And we're just wacky. That's our idea of a good time. But, you know, you bond in that way. And um, I mean, when I hit the hospital, uh, they just bum rushed me. I joked that a good friend, a good friend of mine in the club um, and relatively new friend put a 
temporary dragging glitter tattoo on my arm so that every time a nurse turned my arm over to take blood, you know, it was like a new rotation every day, they'd be like, oh, I didn't know you could do glitter on tattoos now. And, I'd have to, and I was, you know, drugged when he put it on, and you can't shower in the hospital, in the ICU, so it stays, and it looks pristine. And I had to explain every other day, like, no, it's my butthead friends messing with me. Um, but that kind of stuff helps. It means the world. Um, in a way, I met my partner, Erica, through triathlon. Um, she was a retired UCLA triathlete, and so we had that bond, and she knows the commitment it takes to do triathlon, and she supported me um, going to races, going to Nice, France, where we raced. Um, she knows the game, and uh, it's one of those things that I really appreciate about her, and one of those things that bonded us, and um, well, you know, she has to carry all my crap through the airport. Um, it's still something that we do together that we enjoy, which is awesome. And we relay. There's a, we typically races where I can't do the run because of the course. Um, either one of us will swim, I'll do the bike, and then she'll do the run. And, um, you know, she's become part of my tribe um, and all my friends in the triathlon world that she, half of them she already knew. Uh, and it's, it's just a special thing that we can do. Certainly, certainly. Well, I, I wanted this talk to, to have folks out there in, in the audience in the world uh, to see, uh, to be able to reflect on their experiences over the past year and, and realize uh, we all have a different story to tell. Uh, this has been uh, quite a year uh, here at Outlaw Partners. Uh, um, when, when things shut down uh, about a year ago, uh, we all had a meeting and, and talked about how we can pivot and, and to push forward. And, and the leader of our company really pushed our company to, to push forward through this and come up with new ideas. Um, this, this whole Big Sky Ideas Fest and, and TEDx this year, uh, we, we, we weren't real certain that it was going to take place and we're very happy that it has because we're able to bring stories like these uh, to, to the world to, to hear their stories and we can all reflect on, on what we've gone through in the past times. So we, we are uh, um, very thankful for, for everyone here. Uh, we look forward to uh, your talks on Saturday night. Um, please tune in um, at 6 p.m. Um, www.tedxbigsky.com is our uh, um, platform where we will be streaming uh, live the, the talks. We have nine speakers um, from very diverse backgrounds and, and looking forward to it. So thank you very much. And with that, I think we will sign off for the night.